Well, good Easter Sunday morning to you. Thank you for joining us on The Village Online. My name's Ray Waters, and I am excited about getting to spend the next 30 minutes with you. And we're going to talk through the Easter story, but I think you're going to see some things maybe you've never thought about before, and it's going to be a really good time together. I'm glad that you've joined us. I want to do something a little different. I want to share communion with you. And so if you would like to join us, and again, you don't have to, but if you'd like to join us in a little online communion, then run quickly if you can and get a little saltine cracker or a cookie or a little piece of bread, get you some kind of juice, wine, grape juice, water, anything, just a little liquid and a little something that you can take a bite of. And we're going to let those be our elements uh, for communion. And I'm going to share communion with you in just a couple of minutes, and then we'll get into the Easter message, and I think it's going to be helpful. Uh, the last week that we have been in all around the world has been known as Holy Week. Holy Week in the Christian church is the week between Palm Sunday, which we talked about last week, and then Easter, which is today. And just to refresh your memory, and this will also give people a chance to be getting back from the kitchen, I hope, Palm Sunday is that Sunday when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the donkey. And, and uh, that, that's a really powerful picture of what people thought he was going to be as, as kind of a king or a deliverer. That's what happened on Palm Sunday. Then Monday, the famous thing that happened on Monday is Jesus cleansed the temple. There were all these money exchangers and all of this exploitation that was taking place in the temple. And Jesus, with a, a whip, actually turned over the tables and chased everybody out of the temple. He said his father's house was to be a house of prayer, and you have made it a den of thieves. So that was the big deal about Monday. Uh, Tuesday was a big day of teaching. A lot of Jesus' uh, most famous parables are taught on Tuesday. Then Wednesday, the big deal on Wednesday was he had dinner at his friend Lazarus, Mary, and Martha's house. And Mary, in just an emotional uh, being overcome with emotion, she anoints his head with oil, and the oil comes down, falls off of his head onto his feet, and with her hair she takes, and she's trying to mop it all up and putting it on Jesus. She was just overwhelmingly demonstrating love and uh, adoration, worship for Jesus. That's what happens on Wednesday. And then Thursday, that's the day that they had communion together. That's when Jesus wrapped a towel around his waist and he washed the disciples' feet. And he taught them a lot of great lessons he taught them that night as they ate the Passover meal together. Uh, he did this beautiful thing as a part of that time together. As they were eating the Passover meal, he said to them, this is my body, as he gave them bread. Eat this in remembrance of me. And then he did the same thing with wine and said, this is my blood. Remember me when you drink this. And the church has always looked back and said he was instituting this idea of communion um, and in that last supper. So it's a beautiful thing. His followers did that. And then subsequently after his resurrection, the church began to do that. They called it the Lord's Supper or they called it communion or later it was called the Eucharist, but it became a significant part of worship. Then there was, of course, Crucifixion Friday. We call it Good Friday, but it's actually a very traumatic day when Jesus dies on the cross. Then there is that awful silent Saturday where all of his friends and all of his followers just are so defeated because there's no Jesus. He's dead. Everything that he had said was going away, they believed. And then there was, of course, that beautiful Easter Sunday morning when they realized he is still alive. Uh, let me talk to you just quickly about the communion or the Lord's Supper uh, with three basic ideas, and uh, then we'll share it together, and then we'll get into the Easter talk. Okay, first is when you share communion, it is a meal of liberation. The meal the disciples were having with Jesus was the Passover meal. It was actually a part of commemorating the Passover, which is a major Jewish holiday that commemorates the Israelites' exodus from slavery in Egypt, as narrated in the Hebrew Bible. And so it is a big, it's the biggest, it's the biggest celebration in the Jewish year, is the celebration of Passover. 
The Passover meal is steeped in tradition and symbolism, serving as a way to retell the story of Moses leading the children of God out of bondage in Egypt and into the promised land. It's a commemorative meal that is celebrated annually. Three of the Gospels make mention of the fact that this was a Passover meal. So I think it's significant for us to maybe say that's one thing to remember. God wants people free. God doesn't want people to be in bondage. That's the story of the Exodus. God doesn't want people to be in bondage. He wants people to be free. And you might be watching today and you might be in some bondage. And I don't know what it might be. Maybe it's to an addiction. Maybe it's to um, some financial situation. I, I don't know. But if you are in bondage, I want you to know that God's message is a message of, of liberty, of setting people free. Second, I like to always remember it's an egalitarian meal. It recalls Jesus' table fellowship with the marginalized and the outcast. I love that Jesus had the most diverse group of friends, the most diverse group of people that he shared meals with, of anybody you will ever read about. And that has become a model for us. We want to be that kind of a person. Jesus really was setting up an everybody church. He was doing everybody church way before we started doing everybody church. It was for all people. There was no sense looking down your nose on anybody because no one is less than you. No one is greater than you. The ground is level for all of us. It was an egalitarian meal representing all of the meals Jesus had egalitarian. Third thing is this. It was a shared meal with a shared community. In the early church, when they would have communion, the Lord's table, um, they would do it and it was a common meal. They would be sharing a meal together. And people who didn't have would be able to eat provided by those who did have. It was a beautiful thing. And at least one day a week, everybody was fed. And that was a great thing. Now, I understand doing it online or even the way church is now, we are not gathering in such a way of having a common meal. Uh, we do it sometimes. We'll do picnics and things like that, but we're not doing it regularly and tying it to communion. But I think the idea is when you understand uh, that you're a follower of, of Jesus, that you're a lover of God, then this idea of me wanting to share with you you wanting to share with me, us wanting to share together, that becomes very much an important part of our lives. So that's something that I think is important for all of us to think about. Those three ideas uh, are important for us to remember about communion. And then I want us to share it together. So if you have your piece of bread, our little cracker, a little cookie, I want you to hold it in your hand. I want you to think about the fact that Jesus with his friends seated around that table, that that Friday night or Thursday night, Jesus seated around that table, took the bread and he said, this is my body. They didn't understand what he was talking about. This is my body broken for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. So eat it. And then he took the wine. Can you tell I was a Baptist preacher for a long time? I didn't have any wine handy, so we're gonna use water, but he took the wine and he said, this is my blood that is shed for you. Drink this in remembrance of me. Again, that they, they would never have understood what this meant. But later, we're able to say, okay, he was talking about his death for all of us, showing us God's love. So let's drink together. And I thank you for sharing with us. I hope it was meaningful to you. Um, it's meaningful to me to think that some people out there just did that with us, and uh, I appreciate that very much. Well, let's get into Easter, okay? This is the day we celebrate the belief that Jesus, who was killed and placed in a tomb, was resurrected on the third day. I want to read from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 16, verses 1 through 8. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, Who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. 
Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter. By the way, parenthetically, that little and Peter. Remember, Peter had denied Jesus three times, and so Peter was probably feeling lower than lower than low. And so there was tell the disciples and tell Peter, tell them, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Verse 8, trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb, and they said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. So Here's the deal. It's going to be simple. And you're going to hopefully find yourself in, in one of two, possibly three categories. I want to talk about the two different types of people who might be watching. And the first group I want to address are the people watching who, if pressed, would, would admit that they have little or no faith. And I know scores of people who would say, Ray, I have little or no faith. Or they would say, hey, I once had faith. I did have faith. But for whatever reason, season of life that I'm in right now, faith is a million miles away from me. It doesn't really work for me. That's not where I am. I want to walk you through the story, and I want to show you something that I'd never seen. I guess 35 years of preaching, I had never seen it. And then I heard Stan several years ago bring this up. And since then, I can't get away from it. So uh, the, I, this will resonate with you. The first verse we read said some women had bought spices when the Sabbath was over so that they could go and anoint the body of Jesus. These ladies are going to be the first ones to share the news of the resurrection. And let me parenthetically just insert one of the things that makes the story compelling to me is that women in the writing of this, women were the ones who first reported it. If we had lived in the first century and we wanted to fabricate a story, we would not script it for women to be eyewitnesses. Uh, let me say it like this. In the Middle East 2,000 years ago, the testimony of a woman was regarded as inferior to that of a man. If an author had simply made up the discovery of the empty tomb and tried to make it seem as believable as possible, well, women would certainly not have been included as witnesses. That's not a helpful thing. Even in a court of law, women were regarded as being, compared to men at least, unqualified as witnesses. Now that seems incredible, I know, but we shouldn't get too self-righteous because you do realize women could not vote in America until the ratification of the 19th Amendment in 1920, just a little over 100 years ago. And in my lifetime, did you know in the early 70s in the United States, women couldn't have personal credit cards? Credit cards had to be in the names of their husbands. So, you know, we, we can go and say, how stupid were they? 2,000 years ago, well, we, we're still fighting this whole thing. Many churches still do not believe a woman can be a pastor preaching the good news of Jesus. Isn't that funny? Not funny ha-ha, but funny strange that 2,000 years after women bearing that resurrection story would still not be qualified to be communicators of that truth. Sadly, there are countries and sadder, even churches around the world that still ha try to hold women down to lesser roles. Never forget that Paul wrote, God said, for those who understand his kingdom, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, slave or free, male or female. We're all one. We're all one. So it's a big deal. We're all equal in God's sight. So get back to the story. Women early on Sunday morning, they go to the tomb. Question, why? Did they think Jesus had been raised from the dead? No, they bought spices to anoint his dead body. Well, shouldn't they have assumed that he was resurrected? No. Did he speak clearly? Well, reading back into it, we can say, well, yeah, it seemed kind of obvious, but obviously nobody was picking up on it because nobody expected resurrection. He had said, at least the text says, tear this temple down, meaning his body, and It'll be raised up in three days, or just as Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days, so shall the Son of Man be in the belly of the earth three days. That's all there, but nobody was expecting resurrection. They were not expecting a risen Jesus. The women who saw him first were not hopeful of his resurrection at all. Again, 
I had never thought of this application until a few years ago when I heard Stan preach about Easter, but it became for me an aha moment, and maybe it will become an aha moment for you. These women did not go to the tomb expecting a risen Jesus. They went expecting to find a dead Jesus. And to those apparently no faith women, Jesus appeared. So I ask again, why did they go? Well, they went because they were respectful and they had loved him and they were good people and they were doing a good thing. They had believed, but he had died and they couldn't do anything about that. But they thought we can do something. We can anoint his dead body so it won't stink as it decays in the tomb. So they took probably all the money that they had and they bought spices. I imagine they had said to each other on Saturday night, we'll meet in the morning and we'll walk to the tomb. So here it is, Sunday morning on their way to the tomb, and they're asking each other who will move the stone away. And when they arrive, the tomb is empty, and an angelic being tells them, He is not here. He's risen. Isn't it interesting that the people who saw Jesus first after his death were good people who did not expect to encounter the risen Christ? That was not what they were looking for. Good people who were honorable, kind, just doing very good things. Now, there are different types of stories of faith, and none are better than any of the others. They're different. There are people who their story of faith is they realize that they were lost, hopeless, reckless, horrible human beings, and they discover that God loved them and with a deep love, and it changed their life. John Newton is an example. He wrote the hymn Amazing Grace. He had been a slave trader. Uh, operating a slave ship, and one day he came to the end of himself, and he said, I'm a wicked, wretched, bad man, and that God could love me is a miracle. So he wrote the words, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Well, he felt like he had been a wretch. He had transported thousands of slaves from Africa to England, and he felt terrible about himself. But there's another group, and there's people who probably are watching right now who would be in this group. Maybe you just grew up around faith, and so it's never even been a defining moment for you. It's just been, it, you just kind of flow with, with the faith crowd. It just makes sense to you. It just is who you are. It's part of your life as far back as you can remember. But then there's the third group, and that third group is the group that I just mentioned that I think is important, and that's that group of good people with little or no faith. That's the story I think we read first on Easter. So to you who are watching would say that you're not really a person of faith, you either never have had it or it feels like it's dead in you now, I say one more time, the women did not go expecting a risen Lord. They went expecting a dead Jesus, and mysteriously, he appeared to them. But you may think, I thought it was all about faith, Ray. We have to have faith. We have to have faith. Well, the Bible says a lot about faith. Paul writes and says these three things are super important, faith, hope, and love. But you'll remember Paul said the greatest of these is love. You know that God was called love in John 4, 8. God is love, not God is faith. And so I don't want to downplay it, but I want you to know that Doing the right thing, doing the good thing, doing the noble thing, yeah, that often leads us to things that we would have never imagined. And pursuing faith maybe is not the best answer. You never know. One day you might be surprised by the presence of God in a way that you never dreamed. If you're in that I don't know that I have faith category, hang on. Just hang on. Keep doing good things. Love people. Help when you can. And don't be surprised if you meet the mystical presence of God sometime along the way and you realize, hmm, wasn't looking for that. All right, second group of people. This would be those people who consider themselves 
faithful servants of the Lord without doubt or hesitation. And I know a lot of people who would say they're in that category. And God bless you. There are times that I have felt like, yes, that's me. You feel pretty good about yourself? Resurrected Lord? Check. Believe it? Check. You're watching and you feel good about the fact that Jesus rose from the grave? You believe it? No question with you. It's a slam dunk deal. I want to share something that hit those on that first Easter who realized Jesus was resurrected and I think it should resonate with those of us today who believe in the resurrection. Jesus' resurrection signaled that their revolution was far from finished, and it continues for us even to this day. Let me say it again. Jesus' resurrection signaled that this revolution was far from finished, and it continues for us even until this very day. Viewed from our modern perspective, 2,000 years removed, Easter often conjures up images of a serene, almost idyllic scene. You know what I'm talking about, a narrative woven with the soft hues of spring. Notice the soft colors replete with Easter bunnies and an optimistic message about the afterlife. Yet, this portrayal strays far from the essence of the first Easter, in the resurrection narratives found in the scriptures, it's profoundly intriguing that the disciples' fears actually intensified upon discovering Jesus was not dead. You know, if we were just doing it in the way we do it in our culture today, we'd say, boy, they found out about the resurrected Jesus and their fears immediately went away. Everything was great and they decided to dye Easter eggs and play with their children. That's not what happened. Doesn't it seem counterintuitive at first, the revelation of the resurrection seems to heighten the fear rather than alleviate the fear? Look at the first response, Matthew chapter 28, verse 8. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy. That's striking contrast, right? Afraid, but filled with joy. These two emotions we think of as not being compatible and yet, that's what we find. In Mark's gospel, same thing, verse, or chapter 16, verse 8, trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. They just were told by an angelic being, he's gone, he's risen, he's not here. And they were trembling, afraid, and uh, bewildered. Then look at the gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 and 20. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. But again, the doors were locked for fear of the Jewish leaders. And this is after they had heard the message of the resurrected Lord and after they had actually met with the resurrected Lord. What's going on? Let's enter into that first Easter Sunday for just a moment and uh, kind of see if we can understand it the way they understood it. Jesus was crucified by the powers in Jerusalem because he was a would-be Messiah or deliverer, teaching a different worldview than the one endorsed by empire, those who were in charge. And the Jews, aided by Rome, wanted to stop his movement. His disciples are terrified because they know they killed Jesus then these disciples are going to be next. But suddenly Jesus appears to his followers. And this next part is very interesting. Jesus does not say, now, disciples, all of your troubles are over. Nor does he say, let's all go to heaven now and have a big heavenly party. Nor does he say, now you can all feel relieved. Nor does he say, thank God, the hard part is over. No. John 20, 21, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. So now, you men and women, you disciples, you go and tell them all that the cross did not silence my message. It actually confirmed God's great love for all people. And you tell them, death could not hold me down. And you tell them, Caesar failed, Pilate failed, the chief priest failed. And now, they're going to have to contend with you. I am sending you to do the things I was doing. 
And I want you to imagine the disciples all with raised eyebrows saying, oh, crap. That's, that's literal, probably, how they did it. Oh, crap. Can you see their fear? I can see their fear. See, Jerusalem's still a powder keg. It was only 36 hours ago, angry mobs were screaming, crucify him, crucify him. To be sent back to that city to tell everybody the crucifixion failed, that Jesus' powerful presence is still real and alive, and oh, by the way, we are his disciples, and we're going to keep preaching his message. That, my friend, was a very dangerous assignment. They all know that, and it really scares them. On Easter Sunday, see, their lives didn't get safer. Their lives got a lot more dangerous and a lot more beautiful. Easter Sunday, they find out something in the world is more powerful than danger, actually. They're afraid, but the Bible says they are filled with joy. They're afraid, but they are filled with joy. Sunday means everything Jesus has been saying about God, about life, about death, about faith, about love, about forgiveness, about suffering, about giving your life. It's all true. Easter Sunday is Jesus saying, you follow me? Good. Welcome to the revolution. Welcome to the revolution. Let's turn this world upside down by living a loving, self-sacrificing life. Now I want you to model what I've done. You return good for evil that's shown unto you. You care for those society has forgotten. You speak to those in power and you let them know God hears the cries of the oppressed and the marginalized. And oh, by the way, they might kill you, but it's okay. I've conquered death. You'll be all right. And 40 days later on the day of Pentecost, people were filled with the Spirit of God and suddenly that fear, that fear went away. Those who feel you're a follower of Jesus, the call is for you and me to live out this radical lifestyle Jesus taught and Jesus lived. It's not just checking it off a, on a box and saying, yes, I believe in a resurrected Jesus. It's, are you willing to follow Jesus into the revolution that he started? And are you willing to be a participant in those things that matter to him because they matter to God? It means we walk differently. We embrace the ones others discriminate against. We take up for the underdog. We love everybody, even our enemies. This resurrection was not just so you and I can go to heaven when we die. The resurrection was an invitation for us to recognize we live in God's kingdom. And now we get to continue living out the radical, life-changing, even civilization-changing message of Jesus. That is huge. You ever wondered how the resurrection happened? Some of you I know have. Some of you have said, I've thought about this a lot. Whether it makes sense to you or doesn't make sense, some of you say, I've, I've thought about it a lot. The last week of Jesus' life takes up 30 to 40% of the stories that we find in the Gospels about him. Great attention is given to the crucifixion. Virtually nothing is written about the how of the resurrection, and I think that's on purpose. Only two People were there actually outside the tomb, the soldiers, when Jesus was resurrected. Matthew 28, 4, the guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. So I wonder what happened. We really have no idea. Did Jesus blink his eyes and then <gasps> take a breath and suddenly realize that he was alive? Was it abrupt or was it slow coming back to life? Did he walk through the side of a mountain in a metaphysical way? Or did he walk through the opening where the stone had been? Nothing is said about any of those things. Nothing. Paul, who wrote before the Gospels were written, said nothing about the how. The story was never about the how. That's what I want you to get. The story was never about the how. It was about people who believed they had suddenly encountered the mysterious presence of a resurrected Lord. And it changed them. Two men were walking home from Jerusalem on the road to Emmaus. They had been followers of Jesus and they were crushed that he had been killed. A stranger came up to walk beside them. They did not know they were walking with Jesus. And Jesus, in a way, they didn't recognize him. I don't know what he looked like, but they did not recognize him. 
he began to talk to them and later went to their house and later broke bread with them. And as he broke the bread, they realized, oh my gosh, we are in the presence of Jesus. And they later said, when he was with us, our hearts burned within us. Mary Magdalene, one of the disciples that loved Jesus, maybe the most, she's in the garden looking for Jesus and she can't find him after his supposed resurrection. Tears are in her eyes and she sees a gardener and maybe the tears have her eyes obscured a bit, but I'm thinking it doesn't look like Jesus. She certainly would have recognized Jesus through tear-stained eyes. But she says to the gardener, tell me, tell me, where is he? Where is he? And then she hears her name whispered, Mary. And she says, Rabboni, Rabbi. And she knew in an instant she was with Jesus. He didn't look like Jesus, but she was in the presence of Jesus. A man was out on a boat, disgusted with his life. All of his hopes and dreams dashed. He has said he was going to be a follower of Jesus, but then he, he couldn't stand the heat. When people began to say, aren't you with him? He said three times, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. I swear, I am not a part of Jesus' disciples. And now Jesus died. They say he's been resurrected, but I'm back on this boat because I don't believe it. Then he sees a man in the distance flipping fish over a fire. And something inside of him begins to churn. And he says, is that, is that Jesus? And then even years later, Saul, a religious leader who had persecuted those early followers of Jesus, he had persecuted them because of his strong belief in Judaism. And he just did not believe Jesus was truth. He said he was on a donkey and on this donkey, late one night, he was overwhelmed with this presence that actually drove him from the donkey to the ground. And he realized he had just encountered the resurrected Jesus. It's important for us to, to realize this is not about how did it happen? What did it look like? Can we prove it with any physical test? It's not about that. It's about, for the last 2,000 years, people saying, we, we feel as if we have encountered the presence of the resurrected Lord. The argument wasn't about the activity in the tomb as much as it was about people saying, we have seen him. We have felt his presence. He, he came to us in different ways than we would have ever imagined, but we have felt his presence. I want to suggest that that is our story today. We believe Jesus was resurrected. I can't prove it. I don't know if it were physical or not. He appears in rooms without going through doors. He's here and then in a the blink of an eye, he's not. I don't know. I don't know. But I do know I have felt his presence, not every day, not all the time. Sometimes in the times that I want to feel his presence the most, I don't feel his presence. But I have felt it enough. I felt it enough. And I love his message. And I love that I have felt that presence. And that encounter has been enough for me to be life-changing. I want to walk the way he walked. I hope that that makes sense to you. Whether you are not a faith person and you're just doing your thing and you're watching today just by happenstance, so glad you joined. But you might discover the resurrected Lord one day when you least expect it. Or for those who say, I believe it, I believe it, I believe it. Good good. I hope you know you're signed up for the revolution. You ought to be championing those things that matter the most to Jesus. And uh, I'm so glad that you're on this journey with us. Love you very much. Would you pray with me, please? Gracious and eternal God, as we reflect on the message of today, we come before you with hearts open to the surprises you have in store for us, even when our faith wavers. Like the women who went to the tomb, we often find ourselves engaged in acts of goodness, not anticipating the profound encounters you have planned for us. Remind us, O oh Lord, that in the midst of our daily endeavors, you are there, ready to reveal yourself in surprising and even transformative ways. 
We acknowledge that our journey of faith is filled with moments of doubt and uncertainty, yet through the resurrection of Christ, you have shown us that what seems impossible is possible with you. Teach us to embrace the unexpected, find hope in despair, and to see your hand at work in every act of kindness we perform. Furthermore, we ask for the courage and conviction to follow the resurrected Christ, to live out his teachings, and to prioritize what matters in your kingdom. Guide us to be bearers of your love, compassion, and justice, serving others as Christ served and advocating for peace, equity, and dignity for all of your creation. As we go forth, may our lives reflect the transformative power of the resurrection. Help us be instruments of your grace, embodying the faith that calls us to action in living out the truth that in doing good, we open ourselves up to divine surprises you have in store for us. Thank you for this Easter. In the name of the risen Christ, we pray. Amen.